Hey, yup. Right, over the Christmas period, I was sent one or two pictures of customised Royal Enfield Hunter 350s. And very tasty bikes they were indeed. Now, I, unfortunately, I can't share those pictures with you due to copyright issues. But I think both those photographs that I was shown and uh, other photographs of other customizations are going to become widely available on the internet over the next year or so. Throughout the last 15, 20 years, customization of bikes has become quite mainstream compared to how it used to be. Well, mainstream possibly isn't the right term. It's certainly become a lot more popular than it's ever been. Now, there are different sorts of disciplines, if you like, um, in the world of customization. And it might be because of my mental focus running this channel, but it, it seems to me these days, certainly over the last 10 years, that the Cafe Racer-esque type customization discipline seems to be the most popular. Now, of course, the original Cafe Racers came about through a need, if you like, to improve lacklustre, often quite old, motorcycles. To be competitive, both um, you know, in, in terms of performance and aesthetics, with those of your peers. And back in those days, that required a lot of ingenuity, skill, and practical ability, because money was tight and you had to make the most of what you could get your hands on. If you like, these were proper builds where they would cut, shut and weld. Spare parts from other motorcycles would be taken and adapted and grafted onto these machines. With all of the mechanics and fabrication having to be sort of carried out by the owner to a large extent, because they were long on time and short on money. Now, when I first sort of started this channel off, messing about with the Triumph T120, I would often hear the word catalogue custom used in a derogatory term. Buying off-the-shelf components that would just bolt straight onto your bike as a replacement for the original parts, with a lot of commenters saying, you know, this is not proper customization. it's, they're a catalogue custom, it's not the real thing. But if you think about it, actually, this started back in the 1960s. Most of the mainstream makes of motorcycle were all built by the same company. And throughout the 1960s, a lot of the models offered for sale by these manufacturers were in themselves parts bin specials. Sort of rebadging exercises, you know, you might have the base of a Triumph, but... To save money and still be able to create a refreshed model, they would incorporate bodywork components from another make of motorcycle that just happened to be built in the same factory. Now, the era of the Cafe Racer, I think, sort of died out in the early 1970s, and with it, the practice of customising the bikes in that manner. From then on, modern machines just didn't really lend themselves to being customised. I mean, they could be customised by a, a dedicated builder with the right equipment, but it became less mainstream than it had been in the 1960s. And certainly by the 1990s, I think the practice had just about died out. In fact, I remember well from the 1980s onwards... It was very difficult to even buy any accessories for, you know, whatever model motorcycle you had. Nobody made anything. Nothing was available. Even getting a set of crash bars or a rear rack was extremely difficult. And then in the early 2000s, along came Triumph with their new air called Bonneville, or new at the time. And the concept of simple home customization experienced something of a renaissance. Now, Triumph were quite slow on the uptake. I don't think it really registered with them what was happening at the time. But third-party manufacturers, within a couple of years, started to jump all over this. Companies like Moton Customs, Back, 
and British customs, you know, names that we still know very well today, started building bolt-on components to customise these bikes and get them how owners actually wanted them. Now, the original Air Cool Bonnevilles weren't particularly expensive. They weren't cheap, but they weren't particularly expensive. In fact, only about 10 years ago, there were about £5,500 on the showroom floor. But they weren't particularly well-built bikes. They incorporated a lot of cheap components which didn't stand up to the weather very well. The suspension was poor and there was a lot of room for improvement. It became a very popular model on the roads around the world, which meant that third-party manufacturers made lots of parts for it. And as a result of that worldwide, it became the king of customizable motorcycles. Then, around 2015, 2016, everything changed. Triumph discontinued the old air-cold version in an attempt to keep up with Euro emissions regulations, brought out the new water-cold version, which was arguably a slightly better quality, better built bike, but it still had the same flaws. Poor suspension and a lot of generic components that the owner immediately desired to replace but the fly in the ointment was the price had just about doubled it was still marketed by triumph as a customizable platform in fact they themselves produced quite a large range of custom products but again you know there were the same sort of generic components that that originally fitted to the bike they were different but they still had that same generic feel about them and simply didn't have that cachet that owners wanted. And of course, the other issue is that these bikes were so damned expensive now, a lot of people felt loath to change anything on the bikes, wanting to keep them original because there'd been such a large initial investment. Now, the big third-party manufacturers continued making some fantastic custom parts for these bikes, but customising the liquid cold Triumphs became something of an elitist pastime. A lot of owners had pretty much broken the bank buying the bike in the first place, so they didn't have the money to buy the custom components after they bought the bike, which opened the floodgates for the cheap Chinese custom components, which were usually copies of the better brands components. They sort of looked the part, but in many ways they were inferior. In fact, in a lot of cases, you know, fitting those parts to the bike was at best a sideways move, at worst a step backwards. You may as well have left the bike as it was. But the Bonneville, especially the Street Twin and the T120, remained the king of custom motorcycle platforms because, really... They were the only suitable models on the market. Then along came Royal Enfield with its new Interceptor and Continental GT 650s. To some extent, the new water-cooled Bonneville was still built to the old formula, large capacity. Much more performance than was really required. Catering for a smaller, more niche market with a correspondingly high price tag. And I suppose it had to be inserted in that niche at the time to stay relevant with what other manufacturers were doing. The, the rider mentality was still, you know, bigger is better, faster is better. But in the last five years, the world of motoring in general has changed unrecognisably. Because of the high price tag and large cubic capacity, Triumph had never been able to make any inroads into the Asian market. And the Asian market is the biggest in the world. And Royal Enfield's new Interceptor 650 gave them as a manufacturer the best of both worlds. Small enough and cheap enough to appeal to the Asian market but big enough and cheap enough to appear to the Western market. And within a year, the Interceptor 650 became the third best-selling motorcycle in the world in its class. An enviable position when you consider Triumph's Bonneville has never managed to get into the top 10 in its entire model life. 
And not only had it got into that position, the Interceptor has maintained that status ever since. Now, the Interceptor was an important model for Royal Enfield. There'd never been a prominent player in the Western market. No one took them seriously, and the Interceptor was important because it proved that they could build really good motorcycles at a reasonable price that, above all, were extremely reliable. And part of the winning formula for these bikes, the fact that they were, relatively speaking, so cheap, was that for the same money as just buying a base T120, you could buy one of these bikes and customise the living daylights out of it and still have change. And that meant that more people could afford to do it. It is a mainstream motorcycle and... <laughs> Honestly, over the last year or two, I've seen more Interceptors on the road than I have Triumphs. And they're not just ridden by old men like me, they're ridden by all age groups, both male and female. Now, a lot of motorcyclists in the Western world still sort of lament Royal Enfield reintroducing a single-cylinder 350cc motorcycle, but... Their J-platform, I believe, is a stroke of genius. They have three models, the Meteor, which was the first to be released, and then the new Classic 350, which was released second, and which I have an example in my garage. And then came the 350 Hunter. Now, during my long-term test of this bike last year, I had the Hunter for a full month before it was finally returned back to Royal Enfield. That gave me a lot of time to drink this bike in and think about it in fact it still occupies my mind a lot even now sort of two or three months after i handed it back now this is not a preamble to me buying one for the channel i don't think i'm going to you know replace any of the bikes this year because I need to invest in some new camera equipment and um, computer wear. And to be honest, I've still got a lot to do with the three sort of Royal Enfield bikes that I have. But of the three J platform models, I believe that the Hunter is a stroke of genius. Inevitably, within a short space of time, I think most Western countries are going to see the speed limits around their scepter dials drop substantially. Big fast bikes are already pointless and they're going to become even more pointless as time goes on. Royal Enfield is a very forward thinking company. They've not put a foot wrong so far. And I believe a 350cc motorcycle is going to be the sweet spot for sales in the future. Now in Asia it already is so they've got the sales waiting for them. The Western world I think we're going to need two or three years to catch up and it's going to be forced on us legislatively rather than people voluntarily moving down to these bikes although you know going by comments from viewers on this channel a lot of people are making this decision for themselves and they're downsizing to this size of motorcycle already so there's a demand for this size bike this type of bike as it stands right now, which is only going to increase with time. Now, the J platform basically just comes in three flavours. There's the Meteor, which appeals to a certain mindset. There's the Classic, which appeals to another mindset. And then there's the Hunter, and I think the Hunter is a more mainstream bike. It's going to appeal to a much wider audience, including younger riders, which is a good thing. But historically, when it comes to customising bikes to sort of cafe racer status, this bike already occupies a historically correct segment in the cafe racer genre in the purest form. You see, we tend to think of 650 Twins as being the classic cafe racer of the 1960s but really it wasn't this was the format that everyone aspired to but actually it wasn't the norm it wasn't the mainstream engine configuration most of the british 650 twins were export models that went to the states 
And those were the models that stole the limelight and, if you like, went down in cafe racer history. But here in Britain, where the cafe racer, if you like, actually happened, the norm, or standard, if you like, was a 350 single. A fact that motorcycle history, for the most part, has ignored. 17-year-old lads going through an apprenticeship or working in a factory couldn't stretch to much more than that. They were modest and financially accessible bikes with modest build quality and modest performance and they needed the Cafe Racer treatment more than, you know, the larger bikes did. So, to that end, I'm predicting worldwide that the Royal Enfield Hunter 350 is going to become the new king customization platform. In Asia, which has a huge custom scene, 350cc bikes are the sort of staple diet for bike customizers. They are common, easily obtainable models. A cubic capacity which for many are considered the benchmark. And their saturation of the market means that there are plenty of third-party parts available for them. Now, whereas bikes like the Triumph sort of gain their cult status in the Western world, which partly spilled over into the Asian world, I think with the Hunter 350 it's going to work the other way around. The modular nature of this bike lends itself really well to customization. For example, the seat rail on this bike, which for most bikes it's, you know, it's all one welded construction into the chassis of the bike, it's a simple bolt-on subframe, which I reckon could be swapped out for a custom replacement in about 20 minutes, something which has never been available on any other model of motorcycle that I can think of. This on its own is quite a huge thing. Altering the rear end of the bike to suit a specific look is a main component of motorcycle customization. Shortening seats, shortening the rear end, getting rid of the mudguard. It's also sort of historically one of the most expensive and time-consuming modifications. One that a lot of the mainstream third-party parts manufacturers tend to shy away from because it's just not possible to come up with a part that is easy to install by your average customer. This allows parts to be made really easy, where the entire look of the bike can be changed in a matter of minutes, where normally it would require cutting, grinding, painting, welding, expending an awful lot of time and money in the process. Yet, the way this bike has been built with the seat rail allows the bike to be changed to give a myriad of different looks and seat configurations without even having to unfasten your rear suspension. I don't honestly know if Royal Enfield have made it that way for that reason or whether it's just a happy coincidence, but either way, this feature alone propels this bike into the upper echelon, if you like, for the catalogue customiser. Customers want easy and quick, and this is going to provide it for them. The rest of the components on this bike, although unremarkable in the way they are attached, lend themselves just as well to easy swap out and change over. And I've already heard that some well-known parts manufacturers are working on power upgrades that could get this bike probably up to and over 80 miles an hour. And I know from experience that the engine on this bike is very understressed. It can easily take that. I did find myself sitting in the garage admiring this bike and wondering how the hell Royal Enfield was able to make a bike of this quality for under £4,000. I'm still not entirely sure how they've done it, but it is a quality bike. And that low asking price, that low initial outlay for this bike means that a lot of people are going to be able to scratch that itch of a a genuine cafe racer custom bike bought from you, modified themselves, for a total outlay significantly less than the price of a base model Triumph Street Twin. 
now I'll say it now because people often jump into the comment section and start asking me what's wrong with the bike there's nothing wrong with this bike it is perfectly fine out of the box for those that just want that kind of bike but people tend to be attracted to these modern classic motorcycles because they lend themselves well to customization and I personally think this Hunter lends itself to customization better and in a cheaper way than any other motorcycle on the market. In the process, giving the owner a more authentic 1960s 350cc single experience. Now, this is of course totally reliant on third party manufacturers biting the bullet and starting to produce the parts for this bike it's going to take a year or two and i think initially we're going to see those parts coming out of india and other parts of asia but this bike has at least as it stands at the moment 12 13 years of production time before petrol bikes are banned in the uk and longer elsewhere in the western world which gives plenty of time for people to wake up to this bike and start to exploit what it has to offer plenty of time for those well-known western companies to sit up pay attention and start pumping some parts out let's wait and see what happens right once again thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and my other videos and in doing so helping to support this channel i really do appreciate it as usual, I would be eternally grateful if you would leave a like for this video, subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber, and if you do subscribe, hit the notification bell and ensure that your notifications are enabled. I am, of course, going to be back next week, so until then, if you're riding, please ride carefully, and I'll see you soon.